stuff. But the Lord loves to hear the worship of his people and the heart of his people. And so I trust that you, uh, as you learn the songs and as you're here, uh, that you'll worship and continue to worship and take those worship songs with you, uh, something that we can continue to do together. Um, Speaking of together, well, good morning. And it is good to be here together. Uh, thank you for making time out of a summer Sunday. I know it's not the easiest thing um, to be able to get up this early and, uh, and, uh, and to come and make your way to church. And some of you with little ones still, man, I, I remember that stage. My littlest one now is almost 11. So I uh, thankfully uh, don't have that, uh, that stage of life. I did for many, many years, but, uh, but we don't. But thank you for making an effort and coming to church this morning. I know it's a challenge. And uh, those of you that don't have have little ones. I know it's still a challenge, right? And uh, that extra cup of coffee out there in the coffee shop helps. And uh, trust that if you didn't get some, you'll get some on your way out because it's it's the best coffee. So I encourage you to get some there. As I said earlier, Pastor Jeremy and his family are out on vacation during these weeks, and um, it is my privilege to uh, share uh, some some truths from God's word. And that's what we're going to try and do this morning. Acts chapter two, Mr. Justin, we're going to be looking at verses forty two through the end in the New Living Translation of Acts chapter two, verse forty two. And uh, as, I, uh, as I meditate on uh, what God would want me to share from his word this morning, I was brought once again to this, uh, to this passage, and I've preached a version of this message before, and I wanted to revisit it because I do believe it goes to the heart of what we're doing here this morning. It goes to the heart of what, uh, what this is all about. You go, if you go, if you know the book of Acts, the book of Acts uh, written um, in, 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 and, and left for us to understand the beginning of uh, the birth of the church, of what you and I are a part of here today. Um, um, this is uh, not technically the birth of, Palm, of the Iglesia Bautista Betania or Bethany Baptist Church in Palm View, Texas, but yes, it is in the sense that we come from the lineage of uh, the disciples and the apostles that preach the truth of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus was the Son of God. We sang there, glory be to God the Father, glory be to God the Son, glory be to God the Spirit. You see, you know, we, we believe in the gospel that the Father sent 2,000 years ago His Son, to come and take on flesh. Though he existed in eternity past, he took on flesh. He died on a cross. That's why for Christians, the cross is so important because that is where he died and paid for the sins of the world, paid for my sins and your sins there. And he died on the cross and there, and then three days later, he rose from the dead. 40 days after that, he ascended to heaven. And when he ascended to heaven, shortly thereafter, in the day of Pentecost, the spirit of God came to live in the hearts of every single believer and a new era of God's interaction with man began. And here, 2,000 years later, you and I are following the lineage of that truth, of that gospel that was established in what we came to be known as the early church, the founding church. And and what we see in Acts uh, is the birth of that church and kind of the functionality as uh, as those apostles uh, began to do the work of God and began to show what God wanted and intended for this era, for this stage of God's grand experiment that is uh, the world as we know it. And so uh, this is what we find in Acts. And in Acts chapter 2, um, uh, uh, Paul has, uh, Peter has preached and, 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 uh, and God has done a miraculous work in the beginning as thousands of people are being saved. And that means that they're turning away from their sin and they're believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and the work that he has done and received him uh, for the forgiveness of their sins. Every single person here has to do the exact same thing that we learn in Acts chapter 2, that as uh, Peter preach, they realized that they had followed something that was not true, and they realized that they were dead in their trespasses and in their sin, in the way of life. They had denied who God was and the sacrifice of God, and they needed to accept the Son of God. And so as they did that, they believed in their hearts. They confessed with their mouth. Romans teaches us that was the reality of the process that they would have followed. And so they believed in their hearts, but they confessed with their mouth that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and that he had died in their place. And now this uh, 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 surge of people believing and following uh, Jesus Christ and following the gospel begins and they begin to understand that they they, they need a, a path forward, a, to march forward together. 
And that's what we see in Acts chapter 2 in the latter parts and what i like us to revisit here this morning. i like us to get a full understanding of these verses. And then I just want to share with you a couple simple truths. I'm going to be very brief this morning. I just want to leave with you a couple simple truths that hopefully on a summer Sunday you can walk away with and say, yes, that is something I need. That is something I want. That is a, a, a way in which I want to live. Because I believe it is the way in which we should be living. It is the establishment of the path. And it is oh so important for every single person and every single believer. I'm going to read these verses. And then I will, um, and then we'll pray, ask for God's help. And then I'll share just a few few things that I, God's laid on my heart and we'll go from there. It says in verse 42 of Acts chapter 2, it says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miracles, signs, and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions. They shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity and all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for your word, your truth. Thank you for your preserved truth. Lord, I pray that this morning, your truth would abound in our hearts. Your spirit would take your word and would enlighten it with the light of the truth that comes from you. And that every heart, every life, no matter what stage of the journey of the Christian life that they're on, would be encouraged, would take some time to grow and learn, including your servant this morning. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would guide us, encourage us, shape and mold us. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. It says there in verse 42 some important things. It says all the believers devoted themselves. This is very important. We understand that the church is made up not of simply people who are religious. The church is not made up of attendees. You see, you don't become a part of the church by attending church no more than you become a car by being in a garage. No, no, no. There's a lot more uh, intricacy there, right? Uh, What we find is that these were believers. These were those that had placed their faith and trust and their belief in Jesus Christ. And dear friend, this morning, uh, when we look at uh, this way in which God is indicating us in which we should live our lives, the first thing we understand is that we must be believers. We must believe with all of our hearts that Jesus Christ was who he he said he was. Oh, I, I, um, I had a, made a friend this uh, past week. Uh, his name was Sanjay. And Sanjay is a, uh, a type of Hindu. Uh, uh, it, it's uh, Krishna is, is the name of the religion that he follows. And he owns a big farm right in front of the camp. And I got to know him this week. And we were discussing in the lobby of our uh, main building there at camp um, who Jesus was. And for him, he said, oh, Jesus is a good man. And I said, no, he's not a good man. Jesus was the son of God. Yes, yes, he was a great prophet. I said, no, 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 he, he is the son of God. You see, a believer must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the only one that was capable, the only one that was possible to be able to forgive your and my sins. You see, there are many religions that teach, well, he can He can help and confess for your sins to help you with your sins. She can help you with your sins. You see, the reality is that Scripture teaches us that Jesus and Jesus alone is the only one that can forgive man of its sins. See, the Bible says that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Because see, he was the only one, the only one that would never think of sin, the only one that would never act to sin, the only one that had no sin running through his blood because he was virgin born, he was of the spirit. And so therefore we realize that only believers should be part of the church or or are really part of the church. And these believers that you, you and I now that are also believers at this point now, we become a part of this community. 
We become now a part of this reality. And I want to encourage you this morning that as part of this reality, part of this community, there are some things that are instructed in regards to the way in which we should go, in regards to the lifestyle that we should be living. And I believe that they were important at the beginning, and here 2,000 years later, they continue to be important. I want us to look at it. It says there, all the believers devoted themselves. What did they devote themselves to? Well, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What were the apostles' teaching? Well, at that point, they would not be teaching uh, Corinthians. They wouldn't be teaching Philippians. They wouldn't be teaching Revelation yet. No, what they would be teaching is that they would be teaching God's word up to that point. You see, if you know uh, 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 something about these wonderful 66 books of the Bible, this is God's holy word. It, it is amazing. Um, as I was watching a video because I wanted to better educate myself on Krishna, uh, as I wanted to share with my new friend Sanjay some differences between Christianity and Krishna, um, there was a, a debate going on between a, a, a Krishna person and their holy scriptures and, and a Christian and, and our word. And the Christian man said, uh, yeah, 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 you're saying that, that what about these, uh, you, you, you have questions about God's word. I have 6,000 manuscripts dated very closely to the original writings that I can rely on. What do you have? You see, there is no other holy scriptures that any religion can claim that has the backing, that has the historical reality that the Bible alone has. And you see this morning, dear friend, you and I, we can stand on a solid foundation. We have the truth in our hands. You and I, dear friend, we do not have to shy away from anybody else. We can stand on the reality that what, what was taught to the apostles, what was brought to them from Genesis to Revelation, all 66 books, all 39 of the Old Testament, all 27 of the New Testament, every word is inspired by the Spirit of God, was written by men as the Spirit of God led them to write, as the Spirit of God led them to, uh, to put onto paper the thoughts and the heart of God. And God, in an amazing way, has preserved this word. And you and I today can stand firm on this reality. And I want to tell you something, that in this community, in this reality, of the way of the believer, the believers devoted to the word. They devoted themselves to the word. Dear friend this morning, if you are a new Christian or if you are a Christian that has not grown in the word, can I encourage you this summer, can I encourage you this day to start to become familiar with the word of God? You see, more than showing up here at 9 o'clock and us starting at 9.20, more than those wonderful songs that Brother Josue plays and the worship team uh, sings along to, more than those things, more than your attendance uh, for this hour and 15 minutes here in this service, you will grow so much more if you become devoted to the Word of God. Word of God is His truth. Amen? The Word of God is His truth. And as, as believers, uh, this is the truth. This is the absolute truth. You see, uh, we can rely on friends' advice. We can uh, uh, rely on, on, on good counsel. Oh, there's, there's room for that. But you understand that there is nothing that can take the place of the Word of God. What were those apostles teaching? Oh, they were teaching uh, the truth of Scripture, the Word. And they devoted themselves uh, to that. That is to say, it was something that was consistent in their life. It was a truth that they gave themselves to continually grow in. Dear Christian friend, I don't care if you've been saved for 30 years or for three minutes. You need to continually give yourselves to the Word of God, to being under the teaching. Why, why are we here this morning, whether we've been saved for uh, one week or whether we've been saved for a decade or five. It doesn't matter. We are here because we need to grow in this teaching. We need to grow in the truth. Oh, they were, they were people of the word. And you and I, dear friend, the, the same uh, dynamic reality is important to us as it was for them. Just as it was in this first church as it was burgeoning and beginning and, and starting and that fire and the flame of the gospel was just catching fire. I, it is still so important for you and I today to give ourselves to the word. Here in church, yes, but also Monday morning, also Monday afternoon, Monday night, 
also Tuesday. Every day of the week, you should spend time in growing and learning. You know what I love about our, our reality of our world? You know, there are such, such access. You can go on YouTube. You can go on, uh, on a podcast. You can, you can listen to so much truth. And, and you know what's so awesome is that as you grow in God's word, you'll be able to filter and say, ah, that doesn't sound right. The Bible says this, they're saying that. And you'll be able to reject certain things that are wrong taught, and you'll be able to receive things that are rightly taught. You become a person of the word. I want to encourage you, dear friend, this morning. If you're not a believer, become a believer. If you're a believer, be a believer that is devoted to the word. Be a a believer that is devoted to a way. Look at what it says. It says all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and the prayer. There was a way in which their life was being conducted that was different than everybody else around them. Dear, Dear Christian friend, can I encourage you today that it's okay to understand that our way of life is going to be different than those around us at work? And those around us in our family? Can I encourage you to understand that there is going to be a way in which you live life? Not that's going to be weird for the sake of being weird, but there's a way in which you devote yourself. There's a way in which you prioritize your life. You know, uh, so many people, um, <clears throat> yesterday morning I got up, 8.30 in the morning. It felt different. It's so funny. It felt different. 8.30 in the morning yesterday compared to 8.30 today. And yesterday it was to take my son to a basketball tournament down the road over here in Edinburgh. I get up, he gets up, we're ready to go. See, there's a devotion to sports in our culture that's okay, it's understandable. But those exact same parents, if you were to go and talk with them and say, hey, will you get up and bring your child tomorrow morning to, to 9 o'clock to, to 851 South Bray Fogel Road to have church? They'd be like, what? That's weird. See, the world, uh, it will devote itself uh, to a certain way for a certain outcome. You see, for many of those parents, it's, oh, this is teaching my child discipline. This is giving my child an opportunity for a scholarship. This is giving my child exposure because they're going to do this or they're going to do that. Uh, there's a way in which the world lives its life, but there's a way in which a believer should be living its life and prioritizing its life. I ask you as you examine your own life, as I examine my own life, what are the priorities of our lives? What is the way in which we are conducting ourselves? These were people of the word. They wanted to know God's word. They wanted to absorb it. They wanted to hear it taught. They wanted to read it. They wanted to study it for themselves. They were people of the word. They were people of a way. They, they, they devoted themselves to fellowship, to sharing in meals, to prayer. Oh, there was, there was something about them that was different. They understood how important it was for them to spend time together. That that community was going to be where they were going to encourage one another. Now, you got to understand, this became super important in a few years later because guess what was going to happen is that a few of them were going to get picked off by the government of the time and they were going to be bathed in oil and they were going to be put on top of a pedestal and at night they were going to be thrown with a match and lit on fire and burned alive all because they were following the word of God. And so therefore, the moments that they had to gather together and encourage one another were so important. The moments that they had to devote themselves to prayer, the moments that they had to feel the fellowship and encouragement of one another was so important. And you see, God in his wisdom, he knew that that was not only true of the first generation church that was going to suffer persecution on that way, but it was going to be true of you and I who go to who go to work and who our co-worker makes fun of us because we pray before our meals and because we don't cuss and because we don't sit there and make the dirty jokes that they do and because we don't go out drinking with them and because we don't go out partying with them and they're gonna, and they're going to they're you're going to feel ostracized and you're going to feel different and that was why it was important for you to be around a community that was going to encourage truth and was going to live out truth with you and was going to encourage you in the way so as believers i want to encourage us this morning to be people of the word to be people of the way to be people who get caught up in the wonder of who god is Oh, these people, as they devoted themselves to God's word, the truth of the scriptures, as they purposely and intentionally got themselves together, 
And I want to tell you something. I'm, I'm thankful that we can go to a podcast. I'm thankful you can go to a YouTube channel. I'm thankful you can live stream. But there is nothing that can take the place of God getting together with community. There's nothing that can take the place of somebody knowing your name and saying, hey, Brother David, it's good to see you. Hey, how you doing, Brother Ben? Hey, how are you, Brother James? Hey, good to see you. It's something about knowing each other. It's something about connecting. It's something about fellowship. It's something about being together in that community that will encourage you in a unique way. These people got together. They studied God's word. They made a lifestyle for themselves where they intentionally brought themselves together. The Bible says that in the early church, um, it was it was not just a once an hour, uh, one day out of the week. It was a daily thing. It was an intentional thing. And though here at Bethany Baptist Church, if you, if you go to our website, you're not going to find a service Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We do encourage you to make friends and to, and to, and to fellowship one with another. One of the reasons that this uh, summer, every Sunday night, we're getting together and we go and, and break bread together over in the fellowship hall. The reason it's even called the fellowship hall. Uh, one of the reasons why we do that on Sunday night is that we play together, we laugh together, we enjoy. Because why? Because we want to grow in that community because we need each other because the Bible tells us to do it. But then these people, they, they were in awe of who God was. Bible says in verse 43, a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miracles, signs, and wonders. This was as God was establishing his finished word was not complete. And so one of the ways in which uh, God in his, uh, in his wisdom, he wanted the world to know that what they were saying was true, is that they would go to this man who couldn't walk, and they would say, get up and walk, just like Jesus had. And Jesus would get up, and that man would get up and walk. And, and the apostles would walk around, and they would perform wind, wonders and miracles, confirming with miracles and wonders and signs what God had told them. But the Bible tells us later on that then that which was complete was come. No longer was there need for signs and wonders. We had God's fulfilled, complete word. And so this morning, though we do not perform miracles in the same way, we can still have the wonder of who God is. We can still be in awe of what God can do because God can take a life that was enslaved to sin. God can take a mind that was corrupted and absolutely destroyed by sin and he can perform the miracle of transforming a heart and changing a life and a marriage that was in turmoil and a family that was breaking apart and a hopeless life can find hope, can find restoration, can be changed and the miracle of a changed life it's what we see today. May we never get over the wonder of what God is. Who God is and what God does. Oh, they were people of wonder. They were the wonder of who God is and what God did. But not only we'll finish up this morning, not only were they people of wonder, they were people of worship. It says in verse 46, they worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Oh, these were the people, it says in verse 47, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. Let me, let me tell you, dear friend, I can tell spiritual maturity when I see worship. I can tell how much God has captured your heart and captured your mind when I see worship. When I see you worship, say, Brother John, that's very judgmental. Yeah, maybe it is. Um, but you know, there's something about when God's captured our hearts and our minds that just changes us when it comes to worshiping him. See, I've been there yesterday. I watched when England beat, who they beat? Anybody know? I forget now. Who was it? Switzerland. When they beat Switzerland. What does the crowd do after the game? Anybody know? They cheer. They definitely cheer. Yeah, it was a boring game. But then they yell and they start to sing a song every single time. And the soccer players go to one section where the most of their crowd is there and they join each other and they start to sing a song of victory. You know, there's something about when you're all in on something, that singing just becomes something natural that you do. I, I, I don't know how much Taylor Swift has made in the last two years, but I guarantee you it's in the billions. And if you watch the videos of her concerts, you won't see 60,000 people sitting there looking Taylor Swift. It's Taylor Swift singing. They won't. 
You'll see 60,000 people up on their feet for two hours, yelling at the top of their lungs the songs that they've memorized. I'm not here to criticize that or say anything against that. What I'm saying is this, is that when God captures our heart, when his truth abides in us, when the community and the word abides in us, when the wonder of who God is and the wonder of the fact that 2,000 years ago he crawled up on that cross and he allowed himself to be crucified, not for you to live a comfortable life, not for you to have a religious experience one day a week, but to change your rotten, dirty soul and to save your heart from a, from a life of misery and destruction of sin and to save your soul from an eternity separated from God in a place called hell forever, and to rescue you and to make of you something, a vessel for his honor and for his glory. There is something about that that makes you want to sing and praise and shout of what God has done. They were people of the word. They were people of a certain way. They were people that wondered about who God was, were amazed at him, And that led them to worship who God is. Can I encourage us tonight, this this morning, can I encourage us that we would look to the truth of the foundation of what we are doing, that we would go back to touch base with, with with the roots of where we started, that we would look at the grand design, at the grand plan. I meant to do it. I left it in my car out there, but right now I'm building a house in Benitas and, um, it's amazing how throughout the process, if you've ever built anything, the process of construction, you revisit the plans. See, uh, uh, we, we visit those pa- plans and, and my friend Joe and his construction company, they, they laid the slab there and, 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 and that slab was done. And we didn't throw the plans away. See, the plans were good for the laying of the foundation, but then they were good for the framers to be able to know where to put their studs and where to lay the plates. But then it was good also for the electrician to come in and to know where to put the wires at. And then it was good for the roofers to know how to make the roof correctly. See, we have the grand design of the grand designer. And we got to come back to it. And we have that he said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come and I'm going to die for the sins of the world. And I'm going to pay the price that they can't pay. And I'm going to redeem them and I'm going to purchase them with my blood. And then I'm going to leave this community. I'm going to leave this setup. I'm going to leave this infrastructure that's known as the church where people can hear the truth and be changed by the truth. Chapter two, uh, halfway down, uh, Peter preaches to the crowd. People are saved. And immediately, as soon as the salvation of thousands takes place, we find in the very next few verses, here's the church starting. See, the church is something so important. And this is, this is not because I work here. I don't work here. I don't get paid here. Okay. I'm just, uh, the church is important, not because it's, because it's what God established for us to grow in and learn in and know how to grow together to create that community to create that bond together as we are people of the word, are we, as we are people being changed into a certain way, as we are in wonder of who God is that leads us to worship together and individually. You see, this is what God intended. This is the master plan. This is what we sometimes need to revisit to be able to realize that each and every every era of God's design continues to go back to this reality. There will come a day where God will come and set a new set of rules. You see, the Bible says that one day Jesus will come again and he'll rapture up his church and one day he'll come and he'll establish a new heaven and a new earth and then there'll be a whole different plan. The Bible says that then he will sit on his throne physically and you and I, we will worship him. We will serve him for all eternity. It will be a completely new reality. But for right now, you and I are doing what we need to be doing when we come to church when we dive into God's word, when we grow in his truth, when we sit there and meditate in the wonder of who he is, when we corporately worship and when we individually worship, we are doing those steps that the grand designer designed for us to be able to be the right kind of believer. So this morning, on just a normal summer Sunday, I encourage you to evaluate yourself. Number one, are you a believer? Are you part of this community not by attending, not by being in the church, but are you a part of the church because you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you been forgiven of your sins? If you've never done that, then that is starting point number one. 
an uh, old preacher used to say, it's like hitting a home run and running around the bases and getting to home plate, touching home plate and going into the dugout. And the pitcher steps off the mound. He throws it, the baseball to the first baseman and the first baseman touches the first base. And the umpire says, he's out. Because as he ran the bases, he skipped over first base, touched second, third, and home. But if you don't touch first base, you're out. Reality is, is that you're not a part of the community by being in church. You're not a part of the community by trying your best to do right and behave right and act right. You are part of the community when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. But once you do that, there's a way in which your life will change. There's wonder which will captivate your mind of who God is and what God does. And then there's a worship that will flow out of your life in every aspect of your life. So much more there, but that's enough for now. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your truth. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to work with every life and every heart as only you can. Father, I don't know where each listener is at in their own life, in their own development. Maybe there's some here this morning that do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior. And for them, step one this morning is calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ on July 7th, 2024, and asking him to become their Lord and Savior. Father, there's one here needing salvation. I pray, Lord, that you would work in that life and in that heart as only you can. Your spirit would draw them to the truth. And that the truth would change their reality. For others this morning, they've been believers for some time. But they've not devoted themselves to the word. They don't know more about the truth today than they did a year ago, than they did five years ago. They're not dwelling on your way, on your word. So therefore their life, their way has not changed. They're still suffering and still agonizing in that lifestyle that destroys only because they're not growing like they should. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would encourage that Christian this morning to be able to make commitments, make changes, so that tomorrow they can wake up with a desire, with a thirst to pursue you more, to grow in your word. Maybe to change out some of those friendships and that community that was once part of their life that's drawing them away from your way. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would help that Christian this morning. Pray for some of us that have just lost the wonder. We've lost the awe of who you are. It's become mundane, routine. It's just one more thing. We forget what a mighty work you've done in us. What a mighty God you are. And boy, does our worship show it. Boy, are we cold and indifferent in so many different ways. Father, I pray, Lord, you work in every life as only you can. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let me start with this. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you don't know the forgiveness of your sins, I would love to pray for you this morning, just knowing that you'd like to make that decision, that in your heart, in your seat, right where you're at this morning, that you would like to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior. If that's you this morning, would you slip your hand up? I'd like to pray for you and just know that that's something that you'd like to do this morning, you'd like to take care of. God bless. Amen. Perhaps this morning you say, Brother John, I'm a preacher, I'm a a Christian, and as you preach this morning, the Spirit of God brought some reality to my life in regards to my way, in regards to the wonder that I've lost of my God, in regards to the worship that just doesn't flow out of my life the way it should. And only God and me know where and how I need to make some changes, but this morning God has worked in my heart, and I like to acknowledge that reality. I'd like to slip my hand up and ask you to pray for me in regards to that. Is somebody like that this morning? God bless you. God bless you. Amen. 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 God bless you. Many hands. Many hands. Praise the Lord. You may put your hand down. Thank you. Father, we love you. Thank you for this truth this morning. Lord, I need it as much as anybody, Lord. I raise my hand with that second group. Father, so many times it's just become one more routine. Oh, Father, but this is not a routine. This is a reality that changes everything. So, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would make us as believers different 
in our way, different in our wonder, different in our worship, because your truth abides in us. Your spirit has freedom in our hearts and in our lives. Work as only you can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand.